I'm really humbled and it's an honor to be invited to give this lecture on rethinking science, technology, and, accelerate, and innovation for accelerated development. My objective today is to motivate us all to give the science and technology sector a chance to serve as a primary channel for accelerated development. Let me kick off with a personal story to set a context for my talk. I left Ghana in, for my graduate studies in the year 2000. At the time, my mom, who is not the most tech-savvy person by her own admission, had never owned a cell phone. This was the year 2000. Fast forward two to three years later, one afternoon as I was walking to class, I heard the familiar buzz of my cell phone. When I took, looked, looked at my screen, I was shocked to see that my, I had received a message, a text message from none other than my mom. I had to confirm with my nieces that my mom had actually sent, typed and sent the message. Well, it turns out that she did with the help of, you know, a help sheet, a kind of um, function keys, A or him, B or him sheet. <laughs> Fast forward 17 years later, she's now 82 years old. These days, she regularly Skypes with her grandchildren. And of course, she's WhatsApping 24-7. <laughs> Not only that, she's also an expert in changing profile pictures. <laughs> However, the icing on the cake was when I recently called to ask how her hospital visit went. I was actually driving to work. Went well, she said. I googled my ailment beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> and all everything the doctor said was correct. <laughs> that is how far we have come thanks to technology. I set the stage for today's lecture with this story to demonstrate how technology can have a profound impact on our core lifestyles. Furthermore, breaking down the technological aspects of this story will reveal a finely woven, multi-billion dollar trail of science and technology. The technologies at play are many. Mobile phone processors, semiconductor memory, display technology, GPS, communication technology, software and search algorithms. Each of these represents billion dollar industries that are contributing massively to the GDPs of entire national economies. My opening submission is that we, Ghana, can have a piece of this technology pie that the rest of the world is enjoying. It is possible. I have good news and bad news. The good news is that most of what I will present today is not new and has come up in one form or another in national discussions. The only, the bad news is that the only lesson we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah said at the inauguration of the University of Science and Technology in Kumasi, and I see Dr. Kibi Asante here, I'm sure you might have been the secretary then, on November 29, 1961, and I quote, Modern life, I can't do the Kwame Nkrumah impression, but I'll do my best. Modern life, has become so complex that we can no longer rely on the stone implements and simple tools which were adequate for the needs of our ancestors. In a sense, we must move swiftly from the stone age to the age of the atom. What it has taken other peoples and nations centuries to achieve, we have to carry out in a decade or generation." Unquote. This statement made in 1961 by our first president four years after independence in 1957 
serves as a measuring stick by which we may assess how far we have advanced and even more importantly, what we need to do going forward. To undertake this analysis, and here comes the science, I selected a proven model for situational awareness analysis. It is called the UDA loop. Don't be scared. UDA loop. And UDA is an acronym. O-O-D-A. O for observe, orient, decide, and act. Observe, orient, decide, and act. As a pilot to say, Oscar, Oscar, Delta, Alpha, I believe. It is a logical and applied approach to understanding, assessing, projecting, and making recommendations about a situation or a system. It's often applied in, at the strategic level in military operations and for situational awareness analysis. It's very appropriate for our current discourse because it will allow us to delve into both the depth and the breadth of the issue as far as time will allow us. So with your indulgence, I'll move to the very first step, the observe step. The first step is the process of acquiring information about the system. What we look, we will look at the relevant background information, prior and current, about the state of science and technology in Ghana. A focal point for any discussion on science and technology in Ghana has to be the nation's universities. And here again, I see some of our past vice chancellors here, Professor Diamond, uh, Professor Kilaka Sawyer. In his inauguration speech at the University of Science and Technology, Dr. Nkrumah spelled out clear mandates for the university. This included, and I've just added a few, investigate and research problems surrounding industrialization and agricultural development. Explore alternative sources of energy, such as atomic reactors and solar energy. Develop revolutionary methods of transport and modern communication networks. In terms of producing scientists and engineers, to support these areas listed, our investors have made great strides. However, there is a glaring gap between research or the research that's produced and its broader impacts and application to the practical problems that our nation faces. A lot of good scientific work has come out of our investors, but one will struggle to name a defining technology or innovation attributable to these institutions. This is a good juncture to acknowledge the pioneer roles and contributions of great Ghanaian scientists and innovators. We have such um, an illustrious list. I didn't know where to start or where to end, but with your indulgence, I'll mention names like Professors Alote, Felix Kolote Ahulu, our own chairman for today, Nina Kukweno, um, Professor Dai Mensa, um, Dr. Sprimpon Boateng, our current Minister of Science and Technology, Ave Kluchev, a, a renowned NASA scientist. And um, being Mother's Week, I might not leave out a uh, female scientist as well. Dr. Esther Oklu, Professor Irama Adi, and um, Eva Loko of Blessed Memory. As we continue with the task of observing the system, let's transition from observing the past to observing information that is more present. The other baseline I selected for analysis are the manifestos of the two leading political parties in Ghana. My apologies to all the other parties, no disrespect. I made this decision just for the sake of time. <laughs> I carefully reviewed the manifesto of the NDC and MPP for the December 2016 elections. Examining the assessments and projections of Ghana's current situation as they pertain to science, technology, and innovation. While there are many other possible options for analysis, including State of the Nation addresses, I believe the manifestos of the two leading po political parties represent two recent opposing perspectives on the state of affairs. So I'll start with the NDC document. The NDC manifesto mentions science and technology 
science, technology, and innovation a total of 74 times. The majority of these mentions do have to do with education, so SSS, science and technology, university education in that context. A subsection titled Science, Technology and Innovation opens with the statement, and I quote, through increased application of science and technology in all segments of society, we are gradually moving towards a knowledge-based society, unquote. Nine achievements are listed, several of which are related to the National Nuclear Energy Program. Seven objectives are aligned, or are outlined, sorry, including the establishment of an Institute of Nanotechnology and Materials Science, a laudable idea in my opinion. The manifesto also mentions working towards a 60-40 admission ratio in tertiary institutions in favor of the sciences, so humanities to, sciences to humanities 60-40. The NPP manifesto had a total of 32 mentions of science, technology, and innovation, as compared to 74. Similarly, there's a section dedicated to the topic. The opening premise of that section is, and I quote, science and technology contributes less than 1% of Ghana's GDP compared to an average of 2.5% in the rest of Africa. It is the NPP's intention to achieve at least 1.5% over the next four years, unquote. Four objectives are outlined or are laid out in the NPP manifesto. The first is the establishment of a presidential advisory council on science and technology. The second is establishment of regional technology parks. Third is establish centers of excellence and fourth, support national policy of 60 to 40 admission ratio of science to humanities. So a basic review of this manifesto reveals that both parties agree on at least one objective, and that is the 60-40 admission ratio of science to humanities. I bet that probably might be the easiest option for both of them. My thoughts and observations from the manifesto analysis are as follows. Both the proof is in the execution and follow through. Juxtaposing the goals of Dr. Nkrumah and the state of affairs portrayed in the manifestos paints a picture of an athlete running hard but in place. The achievements and objectives do not represent tangible inroads since independence. Otherwise, we wouldn't be making statements like gradually moving towards and achieving 1.5% of GDP in probably four years. There's also a glaring neglect of a wide array of sectors, like information technology, healthcare, aviation, and transportation in general. So that wraps up the observe step of the UDA methodology. So remember, observe, orient, decide, and act. Continuing with the UDA methodology, the Orient step involves analysis and synthesis of information, but more importantly, contextualization. How does our approach to science and technology in terms of prioritization, agency, and cultural traditions compare with the rest of the world? I've summarized my analysis in three points. And the first point that I'll make is, I've titled that, lack of innovative curiosity-driven culture, lack of an innovative curiosity-driven culture. In one of the most famous anecdotes in the history of science, a young Sir Isaac Newton is sitting in a garden when an apple falls from a tree, and his curiosity leads him to come up with a theory of gravity. I believe most of us studied Newton's laws of motion and Nelkon and Parker and Abbott days. This was in the year 1666. One man's curiosity can change humanity. The giant strides that have been made in terms of science and technology since then point to the continuous quest for improvement by humanity, and in particular by technologically advanced economies. And I've listed some examples here. In communication technology, from the age of the rot rotary phone, to now we have interactive smart cell phone technology. 
If you look at aviation from the age of the Wright brothers to supersonic flight and automated flight currently. Transportation from horse carriages to early Ford cars and soon self-driving cars. Note horse carriages not to faster cars, not to faster horses, but Ford cars. Music storage media from vinyl to cassettes to CDs. I believe some of our young ones might be asking what are vinyl and cassettes. There was something for MP3 and CDs. <laughs> to cloud-based technologies or cloud-based storage, that is. Navigation from paper charts to GPS 10 by 10 navigation. So we see that this list of scientific achievements by um, humanity is very impressive. But what did we, Ghana, contribute to these technologies or as they were progressing? What do we have to show? Where are the society changing inventions, patents, and technologies? We have to think far. We have to think science, technology, and innovation. My second point under the Orient step is lack of progressive improvements to technologies. In addition to the new technologies developed, we are all beneficiaries and users of iterative nature of technological developments, such as the iPhone. You have iPhone 1 through 7. You have Windows 1 through 10. Boeing aircraft 737 through 787. In contrast, since we invented the Kumasi Ventilated Improvement Program, KVIP, in the late 1990s, have there been iterative progressive improvements? KVIP 2.0, KVIP 3, KVIP Lite, portable, mobile versions. I specifically chose this example because the first in the series of Achimota Speaks highlighted the problem of open defecation. Ironically, Ghanaians you know, via KNUST had indeed made inroads in the KVIP back in the 80s or 90s. And if this concept had been developed further, it could have theoretically ameliorated the problem of open defecation. <clears throat> Research is such that problems are not solved at a go. Solutions are a combination of progressive actions over time. Like a forest made up of trees, solutions are made up of individual contributions over time. The World Innovative Index, Innovation Index 2016 version is a leading reference published by the World Intellectual Property Organization. Ghana had an innovation score of 26 and we were ranked 102, so 102 on the list of countries. To give you the context, Switzerland was the first ranked number one with a score of 66. So 1, 66, Ghana, 102, um, 26. Ghana was assessed as performing at our level of development that is measured by GDP per capita. However, six sub-Saharan countries, who we will call our peers, were assessed as innovation achievers at performing their peers. These were Mozambique, Rwanda, Kenya, Madagascar, Malawi, and Uganda. This means we have work to do in terms of innovation. My third point under Orient is acceptance of the status quo. Acceptance of the status quo. As a nation, our motivation for innovation may differ from that of the more technologically advanced economies. Whereas their motivation could be merely curiosity, like Isaac Newton, economic aspiration, power, be it political, economic, or military. Our motivation should be different. Primarily, our motivation should be to enhance the quality of life and solve practical problems. Unfortunately, there is an inherent and systemic lack of root cause analysis into issues, which is the first step toward innovation from the problem-solving perspective. I'll use two examples here to elaborate further. Every year in January, the Hamatan leads to cancellation of flights in Ghana due to visibility. So Hamatan, either K, Kumas, um, or Kotoka, or Tamale, and then flights are shut down. I've yet to hear of any discussion of this problem, let alone proposal of solutions. 
In contrast, similar issues of low visibility elsewhere have led to research and development of solutions. For example, the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA of the US, recently published a new instrument approach regulation that will permit operators to use an enhanced flight vision system in lieu of natural vision to approach and land on a runway in low visibility conditions. So essentially, the pilots have a screen. It doesn't matter how dark it is outside. They can see the runway and all that and then land in very low visibility. Second, I may not be too old, but for the entirety of my life, I have seen women carrying loads, water, and farm produce on their heads. Similarly, Kayaye have to carry heavy loads on their heads daily, leading to long-term effects that one can only imagine. In contrast, to prevent U.S. soldiers from having to carry heavy loads, the Defense Research Project Agency, DARPA, developed a robotic mule that can carry 400 pounds of cargo. The Legged Squad Support System, LS3, robot, as it is called, can also be trained to follow a specific person, similar to an actual trained mule or horse. It can also regain its balance if it accidentally stumbles over rough terrain. Wouldn't it be cool for a grandma in Wale Wale, who I did my national service, by the way, to have this robotic mule to carry her load back home after a hard day's work on the farm? There are several other areas where we continue to accept the status quo. Unacceptably low life expectancy for multiple reasons, low road safety with unacceptably high accidents and loss of life, lack of computerization and automation in several sectors of the economy, and lack of accurate, precise weather predictions, to name a few. If we are to rethink science, technology, and innovation for accelerated development, we must start by challenging the status quo and demanding change. This leads me to the third step of the UDA loop, observe, orient, we are now moving to decide. The third step, the third step of the UDA loop is the process of making, or the process of exploring and making choices among possible responses or available options for action. As a disclaimer for completeness, let me say that in decision-making theory, doing nothing is an option. But I humbly submit that we take that off the table. For our sense of national pride, doing something should be the only option. As, Dr. As the famous story of Dr. Kujabi goes, we are eagles and we belong to the skies. 90 years of Achimata School is a testimony that we can achieve whatever we set our minds to do as a people, particularly intellectually. Indeed, as a saying goes, as a man thinketh, so is he. I've summarized three areas here um, as decision options available to us. And the first is education. I'm well aware that the very last, immediate past, Atimata speaks us on education. We can decide to maintain the education system as is, or make adjustments to create a foundation that promotes innovation. To pursue the latter option, we need to cultivate a sense of curiosity, intelligent questioning, and critical analysis. As erroneously stated in the GES Primary 1 textbook last year, the head is not for carrying a load. <laughs> a mind, as it is said, is a terrible thing to waste. We have to train and inspire our students to stretch their minds to the farthest limits possible. We also have to place a heavy emphasis on graduate education, utilizing masters and doctoral research as feeders for national advanced level research. We have to use innovative approaches, such as problem-based learning, very popular in Sweden, to motivate innovation. In this approach, students learn about a subject through experience of solving an open-ended problem, often a real-world problem. Students formulate the problem, they investigate it, 
They acquire the skills needed to come up with a solution to the problem. It is no wonder Sweden is the second on the World Innovative Innovation Index. We also need to cultivate a strong, mutually beneficial ties between industry and academia. For example, co-located research parks which act as centers of incubation. My second point on the side is funding for R&D and technology initiatives. As the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I had a lot of my speech on football and funding the black stars, but I was advised to take it out. <laughs> Both government and private partners should show how valuable science and technology is to them by making funds available for research. Encouragingly, public-private partnerships, PPPs, are working effectively in other sectors of the economy. And there's no reason why this model could not work for science and technology as well. Government has to show a strong commitment through its funding decisions reflected in the national budget. However, government alone cannot bear the costs and drive this initiative. To complement this, private organizations and businesses should also show commitment by funding strong R&D departments and efforts. Some of the greatest technological breakthroughs in the U.S. were funded and driven by private individuals. Names like Vanderbilt, Henry Ford, Rockefeller, Western House, J.P. Morgan, come to mind. My hope is that future generations will look back and mention names of prominent Ghanaian financiers who led the drive for science and technology for accelerated development. Hopefully, that list will be loaded with accuracy. I would also like to mention the area of specialization. Most Ghanaians will agree that Kadia and Wani Jamain. This is because the Germans have created or the necessary attention to detail and created a brand within the niche of automobiles. Similarly, Scandinavian countries are associated with telecommunications. We have um, what? Maybe India with um, IT, Cuba with healthcare and um, medical resources. Likewise, we need to identify and consciously promote development of a sector or sectors of focus for national emphasis. These are core priority domains that will promote the mobilization of resources and lesser focused efforts as a nation. With today's technology landscape, information technology is a sure bet. It's a sure bet candidate. Here I refer to high-end software development support critical systems and um, in aviation, communication systems, machine learning, and the Internet of Things. Naturally, food technology is another candidate, since agriculture is one of the foundational industries of our economy. Don't quote me on this. I'm not an expert in this area, but it will be interesting if you want to explore the BTS industry, because every commercial I see or every billboard I see is about one BTS or another. If that's our calling, then let's go for it. <laughs> Just as we have placed emphasis on agriculture since independence, we need to place an equal or more, even more aggressive emphasis on science and technology as well. Achimota School is a good example of how competing themes can coexist since it was established on the principle or the premise that all the keys of the keyboard, can, both the black and white, can or are necessary. We should not look only to foreign donors for accelerated development. Science, technology, and innovation, or, and innovation is a viable option. Yes, we know that the advanced economies are in a comfortable lead. <laughs> but we have to make a choice and then act on our decision to catch up. This brings me to the final step of the UDA loop, the ACT step. This is a step of implementation of selected options. As Professor Wally Soinka said, a tiger does not shout its tigritude, it acts. So we have to act. We need to act on our decision choices. 
And here I have three recommendations as well. The first is on legal reform. It will be remiss in a talk such as this not to bring up the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR. The CSIR Act 1996 at 521 lists some of the functions of the Council, including pursuing the implementation of government policies on scientific research and development, and also encouraging and promoting commercialization of research results. To put it generously, the Council has not fully achieved most of its intended functions. There's, rather high bar, there's a rather high bar for such a body. Um, to this end, it is necessary to take another look at the CSIR to see how it can be made to adapt to meet emerging challenges um, and emerging trends. Sectoral committees, it currently does not have um, a sectoral committee for information communication technology. That is very relevant in today's age. So we need to look at that act to revise it to be more appropriate to current challenges. Apart from the CSIR Act, we also need to look at laws to back funding for research and technology initiatives. This will demonstrate to businesses and investors that share and shareholders the value of investing in cutting-edge initiatives. Legislation initiating tax reliefs for funds spent on R&D and more easily enforceable intellectual property laws are two key reforms that will foster innovation. At this juncture, one may ask, what is the state of our patent office? What does it take to patent an idea, a scientific idea, in this environment? When one talks about intellectual property in this country, our attention typically moves to the literal arts or music. It's about Gamro or Sarkodie or this person has stolen this guy's song or one or the other. But in future, scientific IP should be at par in the very near future. Finally, I suggest the establishment of a position of a chief technology officer at the office of the president backed by a legislative instrument. No modern organization worth its salt can function without a CTO. In the U.S., an act of Congress signed by former President Obama on January 6, 2017, made a CTO permanent position permanent. In doing so, the Congress recognized that in the 21st century, it is critical that the president has a technologist advising him or her on her policy decisions. I think this role is long overdue for Ghana as well. The role of a CTO will be to help the president and the government to harness the power of technology, data, and innovation for accelerated development. We also need a push by leadership. There are two triggers for, of innovation, the pull by consumers and then the push by government. For a technologically emerging economy such as ours, the onus is on the government to push innovation, similar to starting an engine and making it run on its own. I, I present one example here. In, recently, on the, th in third of, on the 3rd of March, 2017, Reuters revealed that South Africa is in talks with major aircraft manufacturers, Airbus and Boeing, to print 3D parts. This innovation, the first commercial application expected in um, 2019, is as a result of South African researchers working to develop the world's largest machine for producing aircraft parts using lasers to melt powdered titanium. It was a result of a public-private partnership. The Aerosuit Center played a key role, and it was backed by the government through, you guessed it, South Africa's Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. So there is examples, or there are examples on the African continent that show that efforts like these, led by government, can bring about transformational changes in economies and societies. Others have, on our continent have shown that it is possible and it can work. At a minimum, it is my hope and expectation that the promises made in the 2016 NPP Manifesto will be fulfilled. We also need to cultivate a culture of enthusiasm in science and technology. We need broad initiatives to whip up enthusiasm in science and technology in this country. Concepts such as a President Science Day where selected students and scientists visit the Flagstaff House 
and showcase their inventions, not to mention maybe mandatory field trips as well, will bring attention and recognition to science and technology. Media events throughout the world have shown, have also brought attention to science and technology. Um, in Las Vegas, every January, there's a consumer electronics show, and it draws huge international crowds and sets the agenda for gadgets um, that are upcoming in the world. Speaking of CES, what happened to our Indotech of old? We used to have Indotech at the trade fair sites, not to be found anymore. Scientific conferences, forums, and journals also go a long way. That was actually Dr. Nkrumah's goals in the enactment of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences for interaction between scientists. In conclusion, and that ends the UDA loop, so that is the um, art step. In conclusion, I would like to quote from President John F. Kennedy in 1962. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone. And one which we intend to win and the others too. Unquote. I believe this is the kind of spirit the founding fathers of Achimota had. This is the kind of spirit we should have as a chorus. And without wavering, this is the kind of spirit we should have as a nation. We have a lot of ground to cover, and time is not uh, on our side. As Dr. Nkrumah said at the inauguration of KNUST in 1961, what it has taken other peoples na and nations centuries to achieve, we have to achieve or carry out in a decade or a generation. How prophetic and relevant this statement is today. Time is not our friend. On January 7, 2017, President Nana Adudankwa Akufuado declared, and I quote, Ghana is open for business. Unquote. If this is true, and it is true, I believe it is true, then science, technology, and innovation is the engine to drive this vision. Every sustainable civilization or economic revolution has been driven by science, technology, and innovation. My question, fellow Akuras and fellow Ghanaians, is are we willing? Are we willing to choose the hard road, willing to take up these challenges? By their actions, I know that the answer of some of our memorable Akuras would have been yes. Dr. Agri would have said yes. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah would have said yes. Today, this humble Akura standing before you says yes. Come join me on this exciting and transformational journey of science, technology, and innovation for accelerated development. Thank you.